I generally work with business owners who might be considered pioneers. So you're a pioneer if you're doing things differently. You have a unique method, system, process, methodology, transformation, outcome, experience. The downside of doing things differently is that it can be a lonely experience. It can take a bit of time. It can take a lot of time to figure out, to figure out what we're doing to the point where, you know, you get that look from your spouse, that look that says, you know, is it time? Is it time to go and get a job at least for a bit? But there's always, you know, the question then is, well, why do we carry on? There's always a reason why. And then this, this comes back to purpose. There has to be some kind of purpose, some kind of North star in terms of what does, as you see it, what needs to change in the world? Because that surely drives everything that you're, all the sacrifices that you're making beyond just paying your bills and beyond just feeding your family, what needs to change in the world? So for me, what needs to change in the world is I think we need to be better connected. I think we need to be more collaborative. I think we need more transparency at the highest levels of power into what is going on. I think we need more, more freedom to, to express ourselves and be ourselves and be authentic as humans, whether that's moving authentically, eating authentically, connecting authentically. And we explored that a little bit in the last interview that I did with today's guest, Marty Spiegelman, where we talked about consciousness in business. In, in short, I think we need greater consciousness. And Marty, perhaps we can start off by doing a bit of a recap of the last conversation. So before we kind of move on and examine storytelling, which is really today's topic, how would you, how would you describe consciousness? Consciousness, I like, I like to think of consciousness the way uh, indigenous people have always understood consciousness. And, and I also found a reflection of this beautiful understanding in the writings of Max Planck, who was a very famous physicist. Um, think of consciousness as, a, as an intelligence, as an intelligent force in the universe. And that intelligence, when it speaks, I'm using that metaphorically, when that intelligence speaks, all of the forces that move and bring electrons together and protons and neutrons, everything that makes an atom, those forces are on the move, creating those atoms and keeping the atoms together and helping them to uh, combine into molecules and then into planets and then into jaguars and forests and so on. So the earliest human understanding, I think, is so beautiful that 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 um, consciousness is an intelligence, and when it speaks, stuff comes into being. Yeah, and everywhere I've looked in indigenous cultures, there's an encoding of this understanding. There's a source intelligence. It's not necessarily a, a god, a thing, a human-like thing. It's an intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it speaks and stuff manifests. It's everywhere. And it's in physics. And it's in uh, the science they call cosmometry. And I really think that that's what consciousness is, first and foremost. It expresses in everything. Everything has consciousness. Um, but human consciousness is different. So that's a whole different subject. But I, I really think that 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 the way Max Planck said it, that there is an intelligence that moves the forces that keep the electrons in their orbits. It's so a it's a, a flow of energy and information throughout the universe that creates everything. I, th I think this is also to a degree embedded in our language when we say things like, you know, we can feel something in our bones, or we feel it in our guts. And this, mm -hmm. th these are the more, these, it's very rare that that feeling is wrong. Exactly. Um, I like to tell my students that that everything inside us came from outside of us. And where does it come from? It comes from that flow of energy and information that is the big consciousness. We are informed 
moment to moment to moment. And the first way we pick up information is through our senses, through our kinesthetic sense, especially the ability to, to register energy. And then we have a thing called the inner knower. Um, and if we're not thinking, we register the energy and information and we know exactly what it is in that instant. Hmm. And most people are very physically oriented. They, um, there's an, an energetic structure that we have that very few people know about. So most people will pick up this knowing in their bodies and it comes in the belly center. And so we call it a gut sense. And we've unraveled scientifically all kinds of little connections in the body, but, but we've complicated the situation. We really do know through our senses first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of consciousness. Um, you could think of consciousness as the human consciousness anyway, as our capacity for perception, which is to know the world through the senses. That's the original meaning of the word. And then our capacity for awareness, which is literally to be aware of what we've perceived. Mm -hmm. And if I have awareness shaking hands with my uh, perceptual capacity, my sensing capacity, then I'm conscious. Then I'm really, really awake. And I think this idea of awareness and perception, I, I can't get beyond the fact that we perceive things as stories. Like it's very yeah. difficult to talk about what you did today in any meaningful context or to see anything from moment to moment mm -hmm. as anything except a story. It's how we kind of, I do think it's how we experience things. Uh, well, exactly. Um, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to talk about this. The, the story, uh, that modern word that we have, it's really um, a a way of remembering and sharing via language of a what's called a timing in uh, South American cultures. There is a, a cycle of action. Something begins, it grows, um, things are discovered, knowledge is created. It, it creates so much momentum and so much knowledge that as that one cycle completes, there is another one that begins in that same moment, but it's the remembrance and embodying of each cycle of action. That's really what we call story. It's a way to remember. And, you know, we talked a little bit, these are, I'm just, I feel like I'm just kind of touching the surface of really big uh, bodies of knowledge, but we were just talking about the neurological fact that we know things through our senses first not by thinking, mm -hmm. thinking is an outcome of processing the sensory data. So we know things through our, our senses first, and even before language comes, still before language comes, it's registered through the senses. So if we're working at the level of the physical brain, it's registered and um, sometimes encoded as images and senses and, and uh, what we call archetypes, which is a convergence of wisdom into a an image or a story. Mm -hmm. And so the brain works on the basis of uh, imagery and archetypes and, and symbols and metaphors way before language. Yeah. And so this is one of the reasons that that story wakes us up because we're, we're already designed, we're already processing and storing information based on what story actually is. Yeah. Just going back to what you said about we know through our senses. So I, um, at least in the temperate months, I run barefoot in parks and on grass. And the reason for that initially was to get over an injury. Mm -hmm. But then it's one of those things where you start doing it and you realize that there's almost like an old memory there. It's like, even though I've never done this before, it feels familiar to me. Like I've always been doing this, but I've just forgotten how. Yeah. I think people that go rock climbing pro probably experience the same thing. Like mm -hmm. it feels like a very authentic form of movement to be climbing up a rock face, even if we've never actually done that before. Right. There's a, a concept that was developed by a guy named Anthony Stevens. 
I hope I have that name right. Uh, he wrote a book called The Two Million Year Old Self. And um, the book is sort of about um, Jung's work, but really it's about the two million year old self that every human has. And um, it's a, a rediscovery of what indigenous cultures have always known is that we have a kind of timeless memory that's woven into or embedded in our protoplasm. It's way beyond genetics, that there's a memory of the species uh, that lives inside us. And if we're awake enough, and especially um, wired into the world enough, if we spend enough time in nature, as an example, there's a memory in us. The body remembers, the mind is like tooling along in, in incredible lag time, but the body remembers. Yeah. Like and people it's go beautiful... hunting, don't they? People go hunting with tribes in the Amazon and say, it feels familiar. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because it is. <laughs> it, it really, really is. And, and um, I, I wish, you know, we think about if we could change anything in the world, I, I would love to spark this timeless memory in as many people as possible. Because it's the, the part of us that knows all the stories. Mm. If, if you, um, if you take an experience, maybe this is an exercise for modern people, take, take any any day that you've lived and attempt to write a story about it, not a description blow by blow, but um, but what if a person you met in the store becomes the archetypal uh, great grandmother of the tribe and the, um, I don't know, the guy at the checkout counter becomes a, um, another person of the tribe. What What is that story? What if you took all your experiences and, and, and put them into a metaphoric expression? you'd have a really different experience of your day and yourself in the world. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Any given metaphor is a, it's an embodiment of a tremendous amount of information. And if we feel it, that image and that shape and that energy, uh, we know a lot more in that one instant than we could ever know trying to put it into a linear sentence. Mm. A recent guest on the podcast, uh, called James Daniel, was saying that every great story actually contains some elements of the three Billy Goats gruff. Mm -hmm. In terms yeah. of you have the troll under the bridge, you have the you have the green grass on the other side, you have the challenge mm -hmm. on the way on the way over, and outsmarting the troll in some sense. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really beautiful statement because I think one of the things that is really embedded in story over the ages is the sort of the instruction of how to keep growing and evolving it's an instruction of how to bring things into being whether it's a field of grain or a community or whatever and how to keep that thing that you brought into being growing and there will be challenges and here's how you move through the challenges and here's all the extra stuff you have for having moved through the challenge and humans have mm. always embodied tremendous amounts of knowledge in stories and metaphors. And I actually think the best stories teach us adaptability because even, even though we're not literally going to go over the bridge with the troll under, it teaches us how to approach different problems. Exactly. Yeah, th this was really the function. It's, it's the a, a way to remember what we've already discovered about thriving. Humans really used to focus completely on thriving and not on killing one another off. <laughs> I mean, yes, we've always killed one another off. There have been surges of that, but but human consciousness, consciousness itself is on the move, creating states of fulfillment if it's not interfered with. And so the, the requirement that we remember how we thrived last year so we can apply that this year and add to that knowledge. It, it's just required for staying alive. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, this is a, a function of story. Absolutely. You mentioned archetypes earlier, and I wanted to explore that a little bit more. So one of the foundational principles of my work is building on what people like Christopher Booker has said, that there's only like really a, 
there's a single plot archetype in across across literature across the stories that matter there's really a single plot archetype that gets expressed multiple different ways mm. so the plot archetype um is it follows the structure of you know things go quite well but the protagonist isn't yet behaving as themselves they haven't changed yet and then you have this period of pressure on the protagonist where it looks like the end is never going to come to pass they're going to fail the dark forces in the story are going to win until you get to this moment of climax where the hero of the story realizes what it is that they need to realize they change internally i think the critique of this is that compared to real life the focus is very much on a single individual to <laughs> to save the world or whatever um but it shines the light on how we can pretty much what you said earlier like how we can change and grow and i think when when, when i realized that it kind of clicked in like why do i keep going back to storytelling in my work and it's because of this facilitation i think of of growth i just wondered if that if what i just said kind of held true for you if there's any anything else we should say about that oh, oh yeah a lot um the um and again you know remembering my work stems from indigenous cultures which i call original human culture so all this wisdom it's not somebody else's it's humankind's wisdom and the the um original understanding of archetype uh, is that it is a body of knowledge or a repository of knowledge and so um the archetypes from indigenous cultures are not just human. You know, the archetypes represent regions of collective consciousness. So as an example, if we take the, um, the Andean, well, it's more South American um, cosmology, uh, it's, it's a, a common model of three stacked worlds. There's a lower world, there's this world, and there's something above us. Um, and each of the worlds has a quote unquote archetype associated with it. So if I take the um, all of the knowledge, let's just take the world we live in. If I take all the knowledge of the world we live in, which originally is about collectivity, about connectivity, about thriving in this world, about having emerged into this world and doing what we can to thrive and transcend. If I take all of that knowledge and I run it through my capacity to uh, create images in my awareness, in my mind, if you want to work at that level, what will appear in my uh, inner picture channel is the jaguar. Yep. Yeah. And if I take all of the knowledge of the so called world below me and I um, run it through my inner picture channel, what I get is something that looks like a snake or a serpent. I get this wavy thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then if I go to the upper world and I take all of that knowledge and I run it through my inner picture channel, if I'm so skilled to be able to do that, what I get is a, some sort of raptor, condor in South America, eagle mm -hmm. in North America, um, um, buzzards in the Himalayas, every culture has something akin to these three archetypes. And the archetype is not a thing. It is the knowledge encoded in an image because our human brains make these images. It's really stunning what we do. We're very good at recognizing an entire complex sphere of interrelated data bits and it comes through as an image and instantly you know everything. You know? Mm. Um, in Central America, the Yaquis have a, um, an understanding of creator. And for them, uh, it's, um, it's the eagle. And they say quite literally in their writings, they say, if you uh, could take everything that you know about creator and run it through your capacity to, to see images, you see this black eagle that is so tall, you can't see its head. So the archetype that 
we have now, our modern understanding of archetype, a, a lot of this we owe to Jung, and I suppose it's very important because by the time Jung came along, we were quite um, over-individualized. So in our Western stream of culture, the archetype has become human. The archetype of the grandmother, the grandfather, and you know, and so on. Um, and so we've forgotten what archetype actually is. And we also, in Western culture, have this, here's a story. Our so-called creation story is being exiled. We um, ate a piece of fruit, which we're supposed to do, but uh, somebody else said it was wrong and we got kicked out. Mm. There's no other creation story on the planet where people get kicked out. <laughs> no, no, no. And no. our creation story is where you get kicked out. We don't belong. We've been refused. And then we have to travel the world killing other things and battling and losing everything except, you know, a scrap of, of our original ship. And we kind of float to shore after losing everything. And then we get to come back to where we started. That, that's our story. And there's a separateness we, between the animal kingdom and the human kingdom embedded in that story as well. Exactly. We have been separated from all the powers of nature that actually create us and the rest of the world. And so I believe that we're still looping in this um, story of exile. Um, other creation stories are stories that encode the processes of germinating a seed so it blossoms into states of fulfillment and amplifies itself. And those stories of creation remind the people uh, what to be in relationship with, uh, remind the people the positive larger powers that they need to stay in relationship with, like the earth and the sun and the winds and the weathers and nature, and uh, remind humans how to steward those relationships with larger powers so thriving not only continues, but evolves. I have a nagging feeling that there's some kind of fractal arrangement here where civilizations as a whole have their kind of origin story, but then you operating as a purposeful business owner, you also have an origin story. Yes, yes, exactly. And it's a very important thing to reflect on our own story, our own creation story. And it ought to include our sense of how we're connected into the larger world around us, even into the stars and the planets and the galaxy. How big is our uh, experience of connectivity? Mm. And if I can reflect on that for myself, uh, do I have a connection to the earth and to nature and to the sun, which some uh, indigenous people call our local star, which I love. Yeah. Do I have a sense of the greater universe and how it might be feeding me or speaking me into being? And is the way I'm fed and created, is that the way my business is fed and created? Because my mm -hmm. business is another microcosm of the whole thing. I think there's definitely been, I think one of the things that maybe has held my business back is operating it or presenting it in a way that is maybe slightly incongruous with how I think with the origin story and where, where I want to go with it. And I think it's it maybe been a lack of perception on my part, but perhaps you have to go through that. It's, it's very difficult to see, to, to see some but when it's on the end of your nose, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, if I'm understanding you, I think that um, the Western story of exile, it, it's in our cultural field. And so we have experienced it. So in a sense, that story of getting kicked out of the garden, so to speak, it, it is every Western person's story. Um, but larger consciousness says, okay, fine, that was a timing, a cycle of action or experience. Great, now evolve to the next one. And, and that, if, if we can really feel that, um, it's not about right or wrong. It's about accepting what has occurred and, and we keep evolving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a kind of mistaken idea. Another part of that story, the exile story, is you have to go back to where you started and, and make it right. 
And so this keeps us in this linear um, causal relationship to life. If this, then that, if I do all the work here, my business will thrive. And then there's, how come that didn't work for me? <laughs> mm. but, but, but what if we say something like um, that, that was chapter one of our larger story. What, what an experience, how much do I know about being cut off from my beginning? and having to struggle and compete so only one person's left standing I know so much so when I come full circle so to speak I'm not going to repeat it and I think maybe this is one danger of undervaluing your own story or thinking that it isn't relevant or useful yeah yeah exactly exactly so this is very interesting because we're so um hyper individuated and yet we've been taught to not value our own story i think this is a, a big value you bring to people that's really extraordinary because our it's, own it's story... probably the biggest factor of pushback i get for people who need to share, who to me clearly need to share their story because it builds trust and people resonate with it but they don't it's an unwillingness to share it It, it's probably the biggest factor exactly yeah um you know i have myself struggled with that (laughs) and they're initially uh when presented with the opportunity to share our story i think people are responding emotionally uh there's a lot of judgment built into our um, cultural origin story it starts with judgment. It starts with you're bad, you're not good. And that's kind of in us at, at a very deep limbic level. And so, um, yeah, there's initially there's pushback. But what I've found um, working with my students, um, there's a really beautiful investigation. Everything that that a person thinks, oh, that's bad about me. That's too tender. Or that's too awful. I can't share it there's a positive value in it. There's a whole chunk of wisdom in that. And so so my response is, what do you know? Because you survived that. It, we're not um, saying that the condition that they were forced into was good. We're just saying, mm-hmm. what do you know? You've got power and knowledge because you went through that terrible experience, that not right experience. But let's bring your knowledge forward. What you were saying earlier about having the three worlds in South American culture, like I think surely that that resonates true for our culture as well, in terms of life on earth, heaven above, hell below, if if those are the terms you want to use for it. Mm-hmm. I was thinking as you were talking that actually in, in in many stories, the protagonist will go to a dark world or an underworld in order to face some kind of challenge that is outside of their normal realm of regular life. Yeah. and they face some kind of challenge and but actually we we do that as well you know we we don't change and grow as a result of staying at home and playing things safe it's the it's the situations we put ourselves in and the things that we went and did um mm-hmm. which is why i think often it's it's the stories that people when i'm speaking to a client about their story it's the stories that they kind of just throw in there and they they don't see the the power in it but it's often when they've gone off and been challenged like this in the in the underworld if you like and then they've come back yeah well you know it's very interesting about this business about hell below us and it the original understanding of those three words hell doesn't exist the world below is where energy and information converges into seeds with enough momentum running through the seeds that 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 germination takes a trajectory and it emerges into the world we live in and it comes through somebody as a moving along their path. Mm -hmm. So the world below is, there's no language down there. There's just pure experience and a meeting of uh, great universal forces and a capacity to let those forces shape us. It was the Spaniards, the conquistadors, who came to South America and didn't understand the three worlds. The Spaniards said, oh, they must mean hell. And they completely got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it was only our, our religions that brought forward that there's a really bad place you're going to go if you're really bad. It was such a 
uh, Western culture is based on this good or bad, and you can't, it's one or the other. Um, that's a long sidebar. Um, but originally, yeah, you have to be able to make relationship with powers bigger than yourself. And we still in the Western culture call that dark, dark and deep, and it's still mm -hmm. scary to us. Um, but this is part of consciousness. Think of a seed in the ground. Yeah, you plant it deep. It's got a whole, the weight of the earth on it. It's dark in there. And what does it have to do? It has to fling off its own husk. That's the beginning of germination. Yeah. Mm. And the only way it will fling off its husk is if it gets struck by a couple of photons that come right through the earth and go, blam. You have to get struck by lightning <laughs> in the deep, dark place where you're under pressure. <laughs> and everything in nature goes through that. Everything. Mm. Yeah, you you gave an example in our last conversation. I think you were sitting in Pisac in in uh, Peru, and um, you had this moment of realization about the role of um, consciousness in business. Like, surely that was one mm -hmm. of those moments. Yes, it was one of those moments. Absolutely, it was one of those moments. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that and that and... must happen to all of us. Like, I don't know how often, but at least spend the time if we're perceptive to it it does happen to all of us absolutely and most of the time people will just shove it away is that that was a bad day mm -hmm. or they get a brilliant idea and and their inner doubter comes in and says that can't be right and these are all um um habitual responses, habitual thinking patterns, uh, emotional reaction patterns that, that we have when we get too inner directed. I call it being self-referential. When everything's about us and we're not well connected outwardly, um, we don't recognize the downloads for what they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I really emphasize with people who work with me is, is, you know, we have a lot of uh, emotional stress because of the way our culture has developed. And in many cases, really good psychotherapy really, really helps people. But there's a level that I call technical that really needs to be addressed. Um, and so I make this big distinction with people who work with me. I say that, that if you uh, would just get yourself out into nature, and if you live in the middle of the city, go stand in a sunbeam or stand in the rain or stand in stiff wind. I don't care what it is. Get yourself out into nature, feel the earth and feel another power and just experience it. Do not think, experience it. Don't think, experience it. Don't think. And what we're doing is training awareness to get off of the ego structure out into the world. Mm. Yeah. And the more we do that, the more that that memory we were talking about, that two million year old self memory starts to wake up and it starts to balance out the, um, the emotional reactivity that we have when we're separated from that connection. So it's like two parallel pathways and you're walking both of them at once. And one of them, you're just playing with nature. You're experiencing nature and teaching yourself to stop thinking and just feel and see and smell and taste and all your senses. And this sensory pathway doesn't intersect the everyday experiences. They, they don't cross over. There, there's any reasoning or explanation. You just play in nature a little bit. And this pathway that you walk every day in life starts to change. And, and we start to change and everything changes. When I, barefoot, direct, yeah. when I go barefoot running, I someone asked me recently you know how far do i run um do i kind of measure it and the answer basically is no i just run for the experience of running and the connection of my feet on the floor and i just run until i don't feel like it anymore yes. but my my attention i think is on my inter internally at least i think my attention is on my feet and on my lungs or my mm -hmm. breath Mm -hmm. there is some attention there is quite there's quite a lot of attention 
outwards normally because mm -hmm. I want to make sure I don't want to step in anything sharp. Right. Um, I was I was talking with someone recently though. I, I was saying that like when I when I go running, my attention is more internal. It's it's more on my feet and my lungs. When I go mm. walking, my attention is more outwards as to the things mm -hmm. that I'm walking past. Mm -hmm. But I've never regretted going on a long walk because of that experience. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'm a runner too. And uh, I'm like you, I, I don't measure anything. <laughs> mm. If we measure too much, we get stuck in a very limited layer of consciousness. Um, it's more about the total experience. And there's something um, about both running and walking that's really quite extraordinary. And uh, and this is putting attention to the earth, feeling the earth supporting us, feeling the earth giving us energy, feeling the earth actually carrying us. Mm -hmm. And you can do that running or walking, and it's really quite extraordinary. Um, I think for most people, it's easier to do this walking when we're running, we're doing a lot of other things. Um, but I, I like to remember to extend my awareness into the earth while I'm running because the, the earth carries me. So it's true. really quite lovely. Um, and there's a little uh, beautiful, this is an ancient exercise, uh, but it is really quite wonderful where you... Um, on your walk, I do this walking because I think it's safer. <laughs> But, you know, if we walk down a path in the forest and our usual experience is we are walking through the forest, we're moving through the landscape. So, you know, do that for a while and then in your use your imagination to do this, but then shift. And in your imagination, the forest is moving through you. Imagine it, feel it, just believe the forest is moving through you. You'll feel it eventually. And it's a completely different experience. Mm. And it gives you a much more detailed um, awareness of where you are in the world, in your life, on the path, literally and metaphorically. Mm. There's probably, in terms of the mycelial network, there's probably some elements of truth in that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's it's one uh, way that the Polynesian navigators mapped the Pacific Ocean with no little gadgets. It was just pure awareness. Um, they The whole culture lived this way, that the world was moving through them. So they were in their boat and the ocean and the horizons were moving through them. It was all coming to them and they would mark it. And they knew where they were so before, so they knew where they were now. They always had a reference point. Um, but the unknown was coming to them, moving through them. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely, it cracks open a completely different capacity for us to know through many dimensions where we are and what we're connected to. Mm -hmm. I guess what we're saying is that there's a sort of groundwork of awareness that maybe we need to be doing on a regular basis in order to kind of ground ourselves in some way before we kind of run out and attempt to start telling our yeah. story as a sort of attention grabbing technique or however people think they're going to use it. But maybe there's a, there's a foundation beneath this that has to be in place. Yeah. Um, I believe that every problem we have in the world is created by the inadequate unskillful use of awareness. We don't teach our children anymore. We're not born knowing how to use awareness. We're not born knowing all the powers of nature or how to focus awareness outwardly. We're not born into membership so we don't feel grounded enough to venture too far outside of ourselves. And uh, this awareness training it's really where my work starts with people. There's a, an entire year devoted just to awareness training, and it's a game changer. Mm. But, you know, we come back to consciousness, if we think of human consciousness in particular, as our incredible capacity to perceive. We're, we are collecting massive amounts of sensory data 24-7, and it's all being recorded. And the we, we're picking up data from at least five miles away from us all the time. It's all recorded but we're not aware of most of it. Awareness has to be trained. Mm. Yeah. 
just thinking about so the audience of people listening to this really is you know pu purposeful business owners who are trying to make a difference to the people that they serve mm -hmm. what what changes can they make obviously building on a basis of getting out into nature pushing their mm -hmm. perception outwards being open mm -hmm. to this kind of download that will happen what what kind of changes can they you know make to build on that um well you know i was just thinking about that as you were asking the question um the the standard answer that i have is um to do some extremely gentle i call them awareness exercises or explorations uh, do them often and don't think about them don't try to make them mean anything and so it can be as simple as stepping outside your door between your front door and your car <laughs> you could do it then um, put your awareness into whatever is around you and notice the first thing that grabs your attention if it's a tree great just notice the tree and take note of its shape and color and texture and size and placement and stuff. If it's a another building, fine. Notice the building, because the building has energy too. If it's mm. if something, a structure, just take note of um, how big it is and what shape it is and what the materials are and the colors. And, and uh, if you could um, get the scent of the building, what, what does it smell like? Yeah, so these tiny, or, or notice, um, let's say you notice the color green, can you find nine other colors of green, nine other shades of green in that moment? And close your eyes and how many of those shades can you remember? Tiny little things. Or in a moment, maybe you're standing in, waiting for an elevator, how many sounds can you hear behind you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or when you're walking, even if you're in a city, walking down the street with every step, feel the earth underneath the concrete. It's almost like we're proactively turning down the mental chatter. You bet. You bet. Yeah. If that mental chatter is going on, we have no access to our sensing intelligence. If we're thinking, we're not sensing. And if we're sensing, we don't need to think. Yeah. But very, very simple awareness exercises. Just use your senses, the sight, the sound, the smell, the taste, the, the texture, of things, the energy of things, especially with no explanation, no naming, no story, pure sensory awareness, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, um, and then track how you change because it will change you. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, you're right. This turning off the mental chatter is primary um, and we, you can't do it by forcing it a lot of people try to turn off the mental chatter by thinking about the mental chatter, which creates Makes more mental chatter. It's like you have to get your awareness out of your prefrontal cortex, off your ego and into the world. Another so I find helpful on that, if I can just interrupt. So I, um, I maintain a journal, a journal every night, and I write about things that happen during the day and how much my kids are irritating me and whatnot. Um, sometimes, something I've started doing actually is posing questions I'm thinking about that could be about anything it could be about business it, it might not be I'll write the question with my right hand and I switch the pen yeah. to my left hand and I write whatever comes to mind I don't I don't overly think about it and I won't wait longer than a few seconds but I'll just write the first thing that comes to mind even if it doesn't make any sense at all and it's been fascinating to see what has come up from that mm -hmm. and I think I think the reasoning is because the logical part of the brain is distracted by how difficult it is actually to write left-handed that that's part of it but there's also the, the the big crossover that happens in the brainstem of all the nerves from mm. one side of the body go to the other Different side, of the, side of the brain yeah i don't know why that is but it's um but if i switch to my non-dominant hand to especially if i switch to my left hand to access my right brain so to speak um, I'm accessing my relational intelligence, not my linear intelligence. And the relational intelligence is where what we call the imagination lives. It's where all of that sensory data is stored. And if you activate it, 
it starts, all those data bits start converging and um, pinging as knowledge, experiential knowledge, images and memories and insights. And it's relational. You can't get to it in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's, that's part of the neurophysiology behind that. But so it's a very beautiful thing to do. Um, and if you add to that awareness explorations that don't include language, then that there's a huge multiplier effect. Yeah. So basically, we're trying to get awareness into our, our sensory experience, our uh, what a neurophysiologist would call our experiential knowledge. Hmm. The first time I did that, the first time I did that right and left hand thing, I was like, nah, this is stupid. This, this, this isn't going to work. And I was like, oh, it did. Work. I, yeah. I was honestly, it was like someone else. It was like someone else was writing. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. I would, I would challenge anyone listening to this who is, who is skeptical, you know, write out on, preferably not right before you go to bed. I, I, I always end up doing it when I'm really tired and it still seems to work, but maybe that's not ideal. But it's write fine. out, you know, write out something like, you know, what, what story should I share with my audience that is going mm -hmm. to resonate the best with them? And then write out the answer with the left hand and see what see what comes to mind. Exactly. Yeah. It's also in terms of neurophysiology, it's something called breaking the set. Um, you're you're not using the habituated neuronal pathways. If I switch, I gotta do something else. This is like a whole different set of um, pathways into the motor cortex. That that alone, everything is everything else is different. And there's a lot of different ways in the brain that that um, one pathway gets connected to another, and um, there's chemical uh, connections and electrical connections. And if you can stimulate um, a really different initial pathway, then you stimulate cross connections that you don't usually use. And so mm -hmm. all this stuff, it, it's all inside us, but it's come from outside of us. But it's a good way to to um, for a person to find their story. I think I'm that's sure. another way. Because some people just refuse to go into nature. Not going to do it. Okay, that's all right. What about imagining your actual story, and using your beautiful technique, Rob, of switching your pen into your non-dominant hand? See what happens. Yeah. I think it's another reason why people really struggle to explore their story by themselves, and I think it's much easier to do it in dialogue with someone else. Mm -hmm. But in some mm -hmm. respects, what you're doing is you're by switching the pen, you are creating this dialogue. Yeah, with your two million year old self, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, with your two million year old self, that actually is a lot much smarter. more wise in some respects than 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 yeah. you give it credit for. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. How else are your students using story? Um, well, these days I'm having them really look at the. Um, their own creation story and their understanding of their cosmology. And um, we're working with some fairly advanced principles that connect to that, but the um, really feeling into on an everyday basis, how the universe is feeding them, informing them, supporting them, really paying attention to that. What shows up in, we can even work at the level of imagination, what shows up in the imagination when you're uh, trying to drive your car to the store or the office, are you aware of the bigger world around you? What is that that story, that that mythic encoding of your connection? Can you be aware of bigger powers? Not because if we're not aware of the larger powers around us that are making everything happen, we end up in our ego structure, trapped in our limbic system. The fear circuit starts firing, and then we're just like. <laughs> It's terrible. So, so this um, the the concept, the principle of cosmology. Do, are we living in the direct experience of something way, way bigger supporting us? And if you know, some some people can't quite feel the whole universe, so that's okay. Um, can you feel the larger surroundings? You know, even if you live in a city, there's earth under the city and stars above the city and probably some land around the city. How big can your awareness of the world around you be? And can that become animated? 
mm. as forces and intelligences that are that are nurturing you, feeding you, supporting you. And so that becomes an active story. And the the metaphors in the story are things that you resource. So if you're in a in a business meeting and it's starting to go down the tubes, maybe I'm, you know, I'm a city person, but I have I've realized that there's this beautiful river that flows by my city. And if the meeting's going down the tubes, I'm like, oh my God, the river's informing me. So if I remember my story that, okay, river flow through me, I'm going to get a download mm. about the meeting and whether or not it can be saved, whether it should be brought to a close, it's going to work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, read, um, it, yeah, I could I, go on. I've read an anecdote by someone called Helen McDonald, who wrote a book called Vesper Flights. So she's a, um, a naturalist and she was saying that she, in moments like that, she imagines all of the layers of the Earth's atmosphere above her and then all of the layers of the Earth below her going down to the core of the Earth and then her plate's currently mm -hmm. in the middle of it. Yep, yep. Exactly. Uh, this is something you also find in indigenous cultures, that understanding of the layers of the so-called world above and the so-called world below and the humans. We are so unique through humans, those layers of consciousness and power and beauty converge. And they're supposed to uh, express through humankind. So we're here to be conduits for that convergence and creative expression. We're here to steward that and be conduits for it. And that's not gonna happen until we're connected mm. to those layers. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. We're pretty much at the end of our time, Marcy. Oh, not again. Not again. <laughs> we'll have to get you back for part three. Oh, please. I would be so honored. <laughs> how yeah. can people um, learn more about your course and your work? And how can people get in touch? They can get in touch by emailing me directly at Marty Spiegelman at Mac.com. Marty with an I. And Spiegelman with a good German spelling, S P I E G E L, right? Classic. Yep. Um, so feel free to to email me directly with questions. Um, on Gumroad.com, I have online courses. There's uh, in particular the Introduction to Precision Consciousness available on Gumroad.com. Um, it's a, a wonderful kind of easy listening course in the principles of consciousness with lots of exercises like we've been talking about today, things, easy things people can do and uh, ways to track the, the outcomes of that. Um, so my websites are under reconstruction. So there are websites you'll find under my name, but um, the best ways I think are the precision consciousness intro course and just talking to me directly. Perfect. Yeah. What, what, what sort of price point is the, is the course? Uh, the course is, um, it's an 11 hour course with um, some extra handouts. It's uh, set at 295 okay. US. US. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will, um, I will find that and I will link to it in the show notes for anyone who is interested in learning more. Great. Terrific. Thank you so much. Great. Well, uh, thank you again for coming on. And um, yeah, I will have a think about what, what we need to talk about in, uh, in part three. Oh, I can't wait, Rob. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Thanks, Marcy.